Hello, in this video we are going to talk about the bootstrap and particularly how to bootstrap confidence intervals for the AL1 autoregressive coefficients. Okay, so first we were going to talk about a bit of the intuition about the bootstrap procedure and then we're gonna um, do a so-called percentile T bootstrap confidence interval in MATLAB. All right, let's dive in. I want to have a look at the AR1 model with a constant and with IID error terms that have expectation or condition expectation here of zero. And usually we construct confidence intervals for this autoregressive coefficient here using the normal or student's t distribution or approximation. Okay, so you can derive this theoretically using, for instance, the delta method um, to arrive that or to you have some critical value, for instance, from the normal distribution, um, 1.96, for instance. Um, and so this will be the lower bound and this will be the upper bound of this uh, asymptotic confidence interval. Now, those estimates are the OLS estimates, okay? And now, consider the case where you don't know this asymptotic distribution or it is very hard to um, derive this or you're not sure that you did it correctly. So it has, it might have even a complicated form. It's not normally distributed, it's not students t distributed, it's something distributed, which we don't have analytically. And in these cases, one often relies on other approaches, for instance, the uh, bootstrap or other in, in general terms, non-parametric or parametric approaches here as well. So in this exercise, I'm uh, wanting to talk about bootstrapping, okay? So that is, we're gonna recompute the uh, a statistic, the the, the t-statistic, where the this, this distribution stems from, a large number of times on artificial data generated from my residuals, from my OLS residuals, but I'm resampling them, okay? And we do, we're gonna look at that uh, non-parametrically, but also parametrically, um, see what happens in small sample sizes, but also in large sample sizes. Okay, so first I want to talk about what is a bootstrap approximation. So some in intuition here on the basic idea and for what it is useful in um, time series and, and analysis and particular quantitative macroeconomics here. Now, what is the point of departure? Okay, so we have, we don't know the distribution. Okay, we have an unknown distribution function, uh, uppercase F here. What we have is a random sample data or the residuals, for instance, okay? And we know that these residuals come from this unknown distribution, okay? And what I wanna do is I want to compute a statistic, a mean, a standard error, a variance, um, or impulse response function, uh, whatever, some statistic, okay? Um, let's call the statistic uppercase S, and I can compute this statistic, lowercase s, in my sample. Okay, given my residuals, for instance, I can compute the mean or I can compute the standard error of that. Now, what is the distribution of the mean? What is the distribution of the standard error? Okay, what is the, the bias maybe? Um, or what are quantiles of this statistic? Um, or I can think about what are likely values under a certain null hypothesis. Okay, well, is this different than two or plus two or minus two? And how do we compute confidence intervals? Okay, so this is the point of departure. Now, the key idea of bootstrapping is, well, take your original data, you know that this co comes from this unknown distribution function, so you have one real realization and simply resample from this. And all those new samples also stem from this unknown distribution. And just do this a large number of times. Now, there are, of course, details on how to resample. You can do this uh, directly or via fitted models or, or, or there are many, many avenues that you, can, um, that you can have a look at. And now, and then I can assess the vari variability of, the, of my quantities and the quantities I'm interested in from these resampled replicated data sets, okay? And I do this without going into the mathematics behind uh, asymptotic distributions, okay? Um, like computing um, 
the probability limits and uh, using, for instance, the delta method, if you are not uh, experienced in that, might you might run into errors and uh, this will take a long time. This bootstrap procedure is basically just an algorithm. So in more detail, let's approximate the unknown distribution of my statistic. Okay, so for some, let's assume this is IID data here. Um, from this unknown distribution. Okay, I want to compute this and I want to know the unknown distribution of my statistic. So what I'm doing is I approximate these unknown distribution by um, computing the statistic on resampled data where I resample uh, from a approximate distribution here. Okay, and you, we typically find the distribution of S under my, this, this F hat by so-called Monte Carlo simulations. Okay, so these are basically, I'm doing uh, something a large number of times. Okay, and those resamples also um, are also called pseudo samples. Now, how do I get this F hat? How is F estimated? And here there are many things you can do, okay? You can have a look at it. Um, you can do parametric bootstrap, okay? So if I know that the, for instance, the error term distribution in a regression or in, in my AR1 model is normally distributed, then I can redraw uh, other error terms from the normal distribution, okay? So this is then a parametric distribution. I'm fitting that based on some parametric uh, restrictions here. So for instance, mean zero and then uh, plug in the estimate of my standard errors there. Um, another approach and the, the most used approach is the so-called non-parametric bootstrap. Okay, so my f hat is based on the empirical distribution function fn. Okay, so I'm, I'm simply resampling given what I have, given the data here. So I'm resampling basically with replacement. Then there are things like a smooth bootstrap where I also take uh, take a look at the empirical distribution function, but I'm using a, I'm smoothing this, okay, using some some kernel and bar and bandwidth, um, or another one would maybe be assuming a certain model that is f hat is based on simulated values generated from some fitted model, and there are many um, other concepts here as well. So in a sense, I need to try to estimate this f hat. Now, the bootstrap has many applications, okay? So, uh, you can compute the bias or standard errors of your estimators, okay? So if you don't have the theoretical results, then you can use the bootstrap to get that. Uh, you can get confidence intervals, okay? For instance, in uh, structural VR models, we get usual, uh, the, the confidence, we want confidence intervals for the impulse response functions, and here the bootstrap is uh, very useful because impulse response functions are nonlinear functions of the underlying parameters, and uh, deriving the theoretical distribution using the delta method, for instance, uh, can be quite uh, cumbersome and uh, is only asymptotically valid. You can do hypothesis tests and uh, try to get the idea of distribution of the underlying uh, test statistic. Uh, you can check um, your robustness uh, or model assumptions. So if you have derived something under the assumption of normality using the bootstrap, you can actually double check that for, for other distributions maybe as well. Um, so the bootstrap is very useful to um, get a quick uh, and an approximate solution, um, particularly if those theoretical steps uh, for instance, the delta method are very complex, are very cumbersome and very hard to get. Or maybe you don't have the uh, experience in that yet. Okay. All right. Now let's have a look at the exercise in more detail. So we're going to write a MATLAB program that will do several steps. Okay. Let's first start by simulating uh, 100 observations for the AR1 uh, with uh, the um, the constants equal to one and we have a stable AR1 here and let's draw the errors from uh, the exponential distribution. Okay, we make just we want to make sure that the mean of the errors is zero. Okay, now let's do this. Okay, let's first do some housekeeping here. Um, let's clear all variables in the workspace. Um, let's clear the command window and let's close any um, plots I have open. 
Now let's do, let's set some options. Um, I want the sample size to be 100, so this is the sample size. And I have want to draw the error terms from the exponential distribution. So exponential random number generator. Let's create a row a vector um, of t and the oh sorry a column vector. So the uh, coefficient of the exponential distribution is one. So the mean is also one, and the variance is one over one squared. So it's also one. So in a sense, I need to delete the one here. Okay, because I want mean zero random um, variables. Okay, so I'm drawing from exponential distribution and I'm subtracting. Okay, subtract expectation to get expectation of u equals zero. And then Let's generate the true data that we would see uh, in reality. Okay, so generate true data from AR1. So let's initialize with NON. Okay, so this is initialize the data vector. Uh, the constant was supposed to be 1, uh, phi, let's put this to 0 0.8, the AR1 coefficient, and let's initialize the first um, the first uh, observation by the mean okay and we have, we know that this is 1 over 1 minus the coefficient phi no that's actually c over sorry c over 1 minus phi initialize with mean and then um, starting the next period t up to a hundred I uh, using the AR1 model. Okay, so C I Y T minus one plus U of T. Okay, so this is generate from AR. Now when you do such simulations, there's always an effect of the initial value that can be quite strong. So what we usually do is to include a so-called burn-in. Okay, so a burn-in phase of say a thousand observations. Um, this is the number of observations to discard. Okay, so I really don't care about this initial value. Um, so let's get that influence. Uh, the AR1 model um, decays uh, the, the influence of the, um, the observations over time. So let's discard this. Okay, so that is, I'm not only using, uh, I need to initialize 1,100 observations here. Okay, so I'm not only doing this for t, but t plus burn in. And here, let me get rid of the burn. -in. Okay, so burn in plus one up to end. So this is discard burn in observations. Let's see. Okay, let's run this first. Of course, I need to also so my y has a hundred observations. All right, let's plot y. Okay, so this is the data set I have. This is my so-called true data set. All right. Now we have done so. Let's estimate the model with OLS and calculate the t, the usual t statistic. Okay, so. Let's do this. Let's do OLS estimation and T statistic on true data. Okay. And here we've already computed a function that can do that. So this was called ARP OLS and we needed to include data. How many legs? Let's uh, do I have a constant? Yes and um, significance value. Okay, so I need to initialize that as well. Okay, so alf equals 0 0.05. All right. Now let's run this. 
and I do have in my OLS is now a structure and I have all the things that we need, for instance, the T statistic here as well. Now let's save the T statistic, okay, into this vector tau. Okay, that was the T statistic already. Now store the OLS residuals in a vector U hat. Let's do this. Okay, so U hat, well, the residuals were already in my structure, done. Now set the number of bootstrap repetitions to 10,000 and initialize a vector tau star. Okay, so let's do B 10,000 and tau star is to be initialized as a vector. Okay, done. Now, let's do for lowercase b, so 1, 2, 10,000, let's draw a sample with replacement from my residuals and let's save this as u star. So this is a new series of residuals. Okay, so for b equals 1 to b and um, let's draw with replacement. So these are my bootstrap repetitions. Okay, this is the T statistic. These are my OLS residuals. Okay, draw with replacement, let's call this U star. And if you have the statistics toolbox uh, installed, you can simply use the so-called data sample command. Uh, there are many ways in MATLAB that where you can how to draw with replacement using the uniform distribution, for instance, etc., etc., etc. I don't really care. I use the data sample here. Um, how many um, new samples do I want to have? Well, I want to have the same number than you had. Okay, and uh, just to make sure that I'm drawing with replacement. Okay, so this is true. Okay, let me uh, show you real quick if you had is say one, two, five. Okay, then this command simply draws you with replacement. Okay, keeps drawing, keeps drawing new use. Okay. Now, initialize an artificial time series Y star that also has T observations. Set the first observation to um, the first uh, observation in your, in your data set and then generate new data, this Y star, by using the OLS coefficient here, okay? But adding the resampled residuals. Okay, so here the key idea is you are IID, so I'm resampling IID data and this new sample stems from the same distribution and now I'm using the model here to compute new data. Okay, so let's do this, Y star, Let's initialize T observations. Um, the first one is equal to the first observation in my data. Okay, so this is initialize artificial data vector. This is um, initialize first observation with real data, you can try out different things here for the initial initialization, okay? You could use the mean, for instance, or uh, just a zero or something like that. You could also add uh, a burn-in phase here as well. So this is up to you um, to, to see what works best, which bootstrap procedure works better for you. So in this exercise, we will keep it easy. Okay, so size of y, um, which is basically, well, this is t, this is simply t. Now, um, let's generate artificial data from AR1. Okay, so this is y star t equals c hat plus phi hat times y star t minus one plus u star t minus one one. 
Okay, let's I'm, uh, let me quickly go over this here. Let's run this again. Oh, of course I don't have C hat and um, okay. So C hat is basically my OLS theta hat, the first coefficient, okay? And phi hat is basically my OLS theta hat, the second estimate. Okay, so let's run this again. Okay, if you have a look at U star, this is a resample from U and U star is, has 99 entries. Okay, because I have an AR1, I have to conditional on the first or I have to um, drop the first observation in my OLS estimation here. So that's why I'm using the T minus one over here. Okay, and now for this data, um, I'm basically again doing an OLS estimation. Okay, so let's call this OLS star. Again, I'm using my uh, OLS function, but now on my artificial data, one lag, the yes, there is a constant and the significance value alpha. Okay, and then, okay, so we've generated data and then, so on this artificial data set, let's estimate the AR1 model and let's compute the um, following statistic here. Okay, so tau star is the coefficient minus the OLS, OLS coefficient on the original data divided by the standard error from the artificial data. So tau star b is equal to the original coefficient, oh no, sorry, the coefficient from my artificial data. Okay, so this was the second, the first, um, sorry, theta, let's see, let's do this real quick, theta hat, the first, this is a vector, right? Theta hat is a vector. This is the estimate of my constant and this is the A1 coefficient. I may want to provide a confidence interval for this coefficient. So minus the one on my true data set, which was given in my OLS structure, okay, divided by OLS star and the standard error of my theta hat, the second one, okay? So the standard here, these are the standard error for my constant, this is the standard error for my uh, phi. Okay. Okay, and I'm saving this in tau star b. So this is what I've done here. Okay. Now, let's, now we have an output vector, tau stars, 10,000. Okay, and let's sort this output vector because it's, this is basically the, the empirical distribution function of my T statistic. Okay, so let's sort this so we can access the quantiles. Okay, so the famous uh, um, one minus alpha half and alpha half quantiles here. Okay, so let's do this. Now, let's reuse the name and let's sort this, okay, tau star. Let's sort the vector. And then we can compute the confidence interval. So the lower bound of the confidence interval, let's call this lower boot. And this is OLS theta hat two minus tau star now I have to get the right tau star times OLS times um, zig theta hat two. Okay. Okay, so these are my original OLS estimates here. And now I have to get the right entry. So where's the tau star? Here, this is basically the lower is one minus alpha half 
times I have 10,000 of those and one minus alpha half will give me the exact, uh, the, the value, the, per, the quantile uh, that corresponds to the 2.5%. Okay, and the upper boot is basically just alpha half times 10,000. Okay, so these, this is the lower bound for bootstrap confidence interval. And this is the upper bound. There you go. Now, what are the theoretical values? Or, um, so we actually more or less finished but I want to compare this with the normal distribution. Okay, so using the asymptotic result, I want to compare how good is our result. So for this, I need to compute the, um, um, let me see. So usually we take the quantile from the normal distribution of the uh, student's t distribution. Okay, so let's f uh, focus on the normal distribution here. Okay, so let's compute this z value, which we can get from the uh, norm inf, one minus alpha half uh, from mean zero and standard error one. So this is the famous 1.6, okay? Now the lower um, asymptotic is Therefore, minus z times and the upper asymptotic is plus. Okay, so this is lower bound for asymptotic um, confidence interval. And this is the upper bound. Okay. Okay, so now let's compare those two. Uh, let's. Um, do a MATLAB table where I'm putting the lower ones and the upper ones into vectors, calling the row names asymptotic and bootstrap, and the columns of the table are lower and upper. Okay, so let's run everything here. And there you go. And you can see that they are very close to each other. Okay, so this is from the asymptotic distribution. And here, this is the one from my bootstrap approach here. Now let's also have a look at the, as this is a distribution, the, the tau star, it's basically my bootstrapped, my, my F hat, right? Let's have a look at that. Okay, so let's have a look at the, the histogram and let's also plot a standard, and also plot the standard normal distribution um, as well. Okay, so let's have a look at that. And you can see that the distribution is very close to the normal distribution, but it is slightly biased. Okay, so it should be more to the right. Now, what if I change the sample size to um, a thousand? Oops, a thousand, let's rerun the exercise. And you can see that the bias more or less gets smaller or vanishes, okay? Now if I do just 30, I get this result here. Okay, so 
like the distribution here, it is biased, but what are, we are interested in the confidence intervals, right? Typically what you have is that the bootstrap confidence intervals are narrower, okay, than the asymptotic ones. Now for large sample size, a thousand, they're almost the same, okay? Slightly narrower. So typically the bootstrap intervals are slightly narrower. Okay. Now, so that was uh, us redoing the exercise for a small and large sample size and commenting on our findings. Uh, now let's not do a so-called non-parametric, uh, that is drawing with replacement here, a, a bootstrap, but a parametric bootstrap. Uh, so, uh, but the wrong parametric bootstrap, okay? So let's redraw you those U stars from the normal distribution. Okay, even though the true distribution is maybe the exponential distribution, we don't know that, okay? Um, and what we typically then do is, well, let's assume it's the normal distribution. Okay, let's, let's see what happens to those confidence intervals in small sample sizes and in large sample sizes. Okay, so let's um, maybe uh, add, add an option here, bootstrap type equals non-parametric, okay, or bootstrap type equals parametric. Okay, so now I want to do the parametric one. So let's go down below um, here, this drawing with replacement. So if um, bootstrap type is non-parametric, then I'm doing the drawing with replacement, else if it is parametric. Let's get those u star, well, from the normal distribution. Okay, so round n. How many, um, well, let's use the length of u hat, 99 if we have uh, 100 observations, and one. So this is from the standard normal distribution, but we want, uh, we have an OLS estimate for the standard error of those u's. So let's scale this by the OLS and zig u hat. Okay. All right, let's rerun this. So this is for a very large sample size, again, very close, okay? So almost identical. And if I would uh, um, do 10,000 observations, those would be really more or less identical. And let's do just the 30 observations. Okay, and you can see again the bias here and also that the distribution is more skewed here as well, right? So in a sense, what we typically find is that you can do both non-parametric or parametric um, bootstrapping here. Uh, you have to think about the small sample bias and there's a huge literature on how to get rid of this bias and how to uh, refine the bootstrap approaches. Um, and we will do so in uh, follow-up exercises as well. Um, but uh, usually what we also find is that the non-parametric approach is actually preferred to the parametric one. And the reason is the parametric one works perfectly fine if you have the right parametric distribution in this case. If you do a wrong um, parametric assumption, parametric distribution, then typically what you can find is that uh, it doesn't work so well, okay? So in a sense, we will, in, the, in most exercises, we will focus on non-parametric bootstraps. Okay, I hope you found this useful. Bye-bye.